Thanks very much, Matt, for those uh, kind words. And uh, hello, and good to see you, and hope you had a good lunch, and you're all fresh and special. This is commonly known as the death seat, you know, coming in straight after lunch. So I plan to make it a little bit uh, different to some of the other uh, presenters that you've seen. Point number one, no PowerPoint slides. Okay? Can you, can you imagine that? Someone's going to talk about pitching, and there's going to be no use of PowerPoint slides. That's just a victory for common sense. All right? Now, if you haven't gathered it already, the theme of my presentation here is on the front cover and it says uh, what you're not doing that makes all the difference. So my challenge for you uh, today in the next hour that you're going to spend, get a return on your investment, get a return on uh, the time that you're spending here listening to this idiot Australian crap on about a few things, get a return on it and do something different as a result. And I defy anybody to suggest they cover everything and they've got everything covered uh, that I'm going to talk about. All right? So there's my challenge. Pick one thing and do one thing as a result of today. Now, they say that, uh, there's a big quote that says that a lack of clarity is the number one time waster in the world today. So I thought a good place to start was to get a definition uh, of pitching and what we all mean by pitch because if we're not on uh, the same page as it relates to pitching, we're going to have a failure to communicate, all right? because we're going to talk about different things. So, Volunteers, I want to seek some volunteers in terms of how would you define the word pitch? And I'll say this is very important because when I did release my book, I released my book a couple of years ago. I was very excited. I was down, I got invited to go down to Book Expo in New York and that, um, I can't, what's the name of that huge big place? Oh, I don't know, the, the big truck, what is it? The Javits Centre. Has anybody been there? Oh my God, it's bigger than Ben-Hur. Um, anyway, it's really cool because you get to line up, uh, people line up to you know, sign a copy of a book and everything. And the very first person that came said, took a look at it, and said, oh, I thought it was about baseball, and then just walked away. <laughs> so, um, so I thought it was a pretty good idea to get uh, a common understanding of pitch. So anybody volunteers to how you would define the word pitch? Okay, um, so you've given us a bit of context. I'm not sure I'm really grasping the definition. How would you define that? Someone, how about, I, I totally respect what you're saying, and I would say yes, it's very sales related. Absolutely. Sorry? So, sorry, confidence to buy your Convince. I'll convince, yeah. convince someone to buy your product? Yeah. yeah, yeah, not bad. Over here. Tell a story. Tell a story. So a pitch is a story. A pitch is a story. So every time you go to the movies to watch a story on screen, you're seeing a pitch. It's a story to sell something. But okay. Well, look, I, I like, I'd say it's a little bit more than a story, um, but I agree. The story is a vital component of it. Articulate your value prop. Articulate your value prop. Okay. Is it a, uh, anybody here in a marketing function? Okay. So this is, this is a really important point. I'm glad you brought up the whole value proposition thing. Uh, how would you define the difference between marketing and sales? Marketing, you're, you're basically telling what you do. Sales, you're actually getting in front of the client and pitching. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. I would say marketing's role is to pique your target market's interest in your products and services. And sales' role is to take that interest and develop to the extent where someone opens up their wallet. Okay, so when you talk about value proposition, Absolutely, there's, you have marketing, typically a value proposition is a marketing term uh, associated with a brand. For example, Nike, just do it. That would be their value proposition that they uh, promote to their clients, for example. A sales proposition, or different people call it different things, unique selling propositions or something like that, is a very highly customised, tailored message to convince why someone should agree to the pitch and why someone should agree to buying the products. So I just wanted to level set on that because that's a really important thing. Because I've had instances where people have been pitching the value proposition as determined by marketing. And that's for a general mass audience, it's not specifically for the people uh, who are making the decision. So I thought that was just worthwhile. I think about it, you know, I don't think uh, the New York Yankees agreed to Nike being their apparel sponsor because you know, they all sat around after Nike walked out and I thought, oh, well, well, why would we choose Nike? And they all scratched their heads, I know, just do it. Oh yeah, good, that's exactly why we do it. All right? so, uh, and I wanted to give you a bit of warning too, that uh, if you hadn't detected already, I am Australian, uh, so we're very sarcastic. 
Uh, so there will be some more sarcasm come out today. Also, we're very competitive as well. Um, and can I just congratulate you? You definitely won out. This is the better session. Who wants to go and talk about efficiencies of e responding to an RFP? Kill me now. How boring. So you're in for a treat. Okay. Uh, one more definition of pitch, and I'll get to where I'm going. Okay. Speaking somebody's interests that they want to learn more. Yeah, I, I would say that definitely you want to pique their interest. I think you want to do a little bit more than just pique their interest. You want to get them to actually open their wallet. So if it's okay with everybody. Here's the definition I would like uh, for us all to align on, if that's okay. And that is, we define pitch as the effort that goes into winning a specific piece of business. Is that fair? This is where you all sort of unanimously say, yeah, I love the definition, that's great. Yeah, excellent. So is that fair? Okay, not bad. All right. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that the, the pitch is the whole sales process. I mean, because if you think about the sales process, you've got prospecting, you've got what you call discovery, uh, where you're understanding clients' needs. Then you would go into a pitching phase where you've found an opportunity, specific opportunity, where you can help the client pitch a potential solution to them. And then you've got negotiation. I would argue that's the sales process and pitching is a fundamental element in there. I see the pitch as the effort that goes into winning a piece of business, a sp sorry, a specific piece of business. So including in the pitch is not your initial discovery meeting where you're trying to understand needs or trying to uncover an opportunity. It's where the client, is, where you've agreed to work with the client said, I think there's an opportunity and you say to the client, okay, would, would you be open to me presenting an idea because I've got a proposition for you, I think I can help you, would you mind? So probably from that moment on, the effort that goes into winning that. How's that? Is that fair? Beautiful. Excellent. All right, um, so how are we going to give you an opportunity? If you haven't had a chance to open this up, if you open it up, what we're going to do is we're going to do, have a bit of a, like a pub trivia. And the boys over here have organised some beers, so some beers will come in a bit later. No, they haven't, unfortunately. Um, but you see there that there are three areas that I want to cover. And these are three really important aspects that a lot of people don't quite understand as it relates to pitching. And that's the importance of individuals, the importance of solutions, and the importance of communication. Right? So they're all really fundamental, important ingredients when it comes to the effort that goes into winning a specific piece of business. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the question. You see it's multiple choice, so it's dead easy. Um, you can see that uh, down the bottom here I've said, assess your odds <coughs> of improvement. So what this is and what this isn't, this isn't a test. Right? So can I encourage everybody to have more of what I'd call a growth mindset. Don't approach this as trying to be right or wrong. Look at it in terms of being better. So try and answer it as accurately as terms of what you actually think or feel at the moment. And then look and wait for my answer and see if there's opportunity for you to be better. Okay? That's the whole purpose. So I'm going to get you vested to see what your answer is. So I trust you've all got pens. And, uh, you know, don't be, you know, the old uh, bacon and eggs analogy as you relate to this quiz. The bacon and eggs analogy where the, the pig's committed but the chicken's just involved. Don't just be involved, commit yourself and actually put a circle around a letter. Okay? Alright. So and I'm going to come down here too. It's too hot up there. Alright, so let's get stuck into it and let's uh, look at the first thing about individuals. So what we'll do is we'll do a round at a time. We'll talk about individuals to start off with. So there's three questions there. Circle your answer, I'll give you time for that. And then I'm going to come back and explain what I would recommend is the optimal answer, uh, and then we can have a bit of a discussion around that. How's that sound? All good? All ready? Right, uh, question number one. What's the best indication of an optimal pitching culture? The best indication of an optimal pitching culture. Okay, uh, question number two. When you begin your pitch preparation, what's your priority? You could even say, what's your immediate priority? Interesting. 
Okay. And question number three. You all answered? Beautiful. No answer yet? I It's okay. It's okay. No, no. There you go. Come on. Make sure it's a, it's a boomerang, though. It comes back, all right? All right. Uh, and question number three, this is one of my favourites, and this highlights a couple of uh, interesting points. According to MPP, so MPP is our company, McKenzie Pitch Partners, um, how important is price in effective pitch preparation? How important is price in effective pitch preparation? Okay. So are we all, all good? Get cracking? All right, so let's talk a little bit about individuals. Um, you'll see also on the other side, uh, the opposite side from the questions, there's a, an opportunity for you to put in your key point. Had I put the key point in there, it kind of would have given away some of the answers, so that's why I said sort of insert your key point. The point that I wanted to get across as it relates to individuals is that it starts and stops with the individuals. All right? It starts and stops with individuals. So stop and think about it. You've got to try and convince a decision maker. Okay? So that decision maker is an individual. You know how we, in, in our business conversation, we'll say, oh, Google are doing this, uh, American Express are doing that, uh, Amazon are doing the other thing, RBC here in, in Canada are doing this, blah, 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 all of that. There is no Google. Okay? There is no Coca-Cola. There are people there that make decisions and there are people there that are doing things, but there is no Google as such. So Google, or these company names, they don't, there is no Lupio. There are individuals in Lupio. Okay? So it, what's this, this is one of the most least understood things when people go into pitch preparation. Individuals make decisions, not companies. I could be pitching exactly the same product in exactly the same circumstance to two different individuals, uh, and let's face it, the one thing we've got in common is that we're all different. Okay, so that could necessitate two completely different pitches because those two, two people have got two completely different value sets uh, and experiences and priorities in life, right? That's just how it works. Okay, so, you know, it'd be interesting to be, I'd love to be a, a fly on the wall in the other room because we get sucked into responding to RFPs around efficiency rather than quality. And it's the quality that's going to win in the business, you know. I'm not gonna, they're not going to select you and say, oh, well, I loved your, your proposal. Obviously, it, took you very, it didn't take you very long to do, so we'll take that. Absolutely. In fact, it's probably not a good thing to say to your clients if you, know, you whiz through the proposal. Probably a client would say, I'd like you to take more time on the proposal and actually think about me a little bit more. Okay, so just think about that in terms of efficiency around RFP production. It's not necessarily the best thing. So, with that, um, the first question is sort of an overarching, really important thing as it relates to pitching, as it relates to pitching culture. Uh, I thought I'd share with you a story. Uh, I went down to, I was in New York with a major financial institution. It may have a blue box in its logo. Um, I went down there with a pretty significant uh, division uh, and a president of that division and his lieutenants, if you like. And he said, oh, Hamish, I want you to come down and do a half-day session. I said, beautiful, no worries. And the first thing I did, I said, guys, and there are about 25, there are 25 VPs or SVPs of a very prominent division in this company. And I said to them, uh, here, here's what we'll do to start with. I want you to imagine, hypothetically speaking, that in your teams, because these are all bosses of large sales teams, in your team there's a major high-stakes bid pitch going on at the moment. And you obviously don't get involved, you know, you're way too important. Um, but I want you to imagine this is that, uh, tell me, email me, uh, first of all, the process that you would operate to. So just send me an email with a number of steps, a name for each step, and a bit of an explanation as to what happens in each step. So again, so these are all people in the same division, in a major corporation, um, and they all work for the same company. Anybody want to have a guess what happened? What's that? Who said? All different responses, yeah. I, and, and I'd like to think I caught some, some sort of a bell-shaped curve or something like that, but it wasn't. It was all over the shop. So I want you to think about that. Um, anybody excited about the Raptors at the moment? Absolutely. How cool was that? Now, think about this. If we went to each one of those individual players right, and asked them what the game plan was at any one time, what, you would, what would you expect to see? Or what you would expect to hear? 
you'd expect to see consistency, wouldn't you? Imagine there is no way they could get to where they are at the moment if they weren't all aligned as a team operating to the same game plan. And it's exactly the same in pitching. Um, so is there any, can I ask here, is there anybody here um, who has a pitching process that they operate to? Or can I just get a show of hands? Hands up whose company or business has a pitching process they operate to. Can, can I see them right up? So I would, would you, 20%? Okay, so if there's only one thing you take away, there's the opportunity. Think about that. I mean, culture, the pitching culture is probably the one, the pitching process, I mean, is one of the most indicative signs of a company's culture that you can test straight away. I work with a major global organisation. The CEO says to their, said, whenever I go into an office, I could walk in and I say, there's a pitch going on and see what they do. If they all operate to exactly the same process and they know what's going on, then he says, that, that market, that's got a good culture. But if I walk in there and everybody's going different directions and what we say in Australia, with the, like chooks with their head cut off, he said, that is a bad culture. Okay, so as an indication, you know, 80%, isn't it unbelievable in terms of the sophistication uh, we're in, t in today's world, yet we're still not operating to a pitch preparation process. So it's absolutely, if I can see, it is uh, B is the answer that I was looking for. So if you didn't write B, there's opportunity, immediate opportunity for you to be better. And, and just let me explain that a little bit more, think about it. So let's say we are here today, so we're Wednesday, uh, May 30. Let's say we've got a month to put a proposal together in a month's time. So you've got today and then you've got a month's time. There's a lot of things that you're going to have to do. As William Edwards Deming says, and anybody know William Edwards Deming? William Edwards Deming was a US industrialist who helped revolutionise manufacturing. Uh, in Japan after World War II. Uh, he's very well known. Also known for the 80-20 rule, which I'll probably talk about uh, a little bit later. He says, if you can't describe what you do as a process, you don't know what you're doing. So think about that. And I know there's agile methodologies and all this sort of thing creeping into our world today, and that's sort of fair enough, I guess. But when it comes to pitching, you've got a clear target. You've got a clear target that you're after. That's why it's sort of on the cover of my book. You know, so there's a clear focus, so think about that. If you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. All right, so that's what we recommend in our whole, pro and we operate to a process of strategy, story, presentation. So strategy, for example, is working out strategically why you're going to be successful. So it's analysing the decision makers, working out what you're actually going to propose to the client. Then, uh, to my gentleman over here, then you develop a story in terms of how you're going to communicate that to your client. Um, and then the presentation, that's when you think about the experience. Fascinating how most people think it's just a presentation, but there's so much more to it uh, than that. Okay, so strategy, story, presentation as a conceptual uh, presentation process. And really when you think about it, it's like do your homework, work out what the client needs, come up with a solution, strategically work out why you're going to be successful, Tell a story, if you've got a story to tell, the, the, the presentation is pretty much tell it how it is. The presentation, and you'll hear me talk about this a bit later, is not a PowerPoint deck. And I'm deliberately not using slides to reinforce that. And I'm glad that I'm seeing some nods uh, in the audience as well. Okay, so we've established that the individuals in your team need to operate to a process. In fact, anybody in the whole sales team, I'd say the whole company should have a pitch culture that they're operating to. Okay, if they want to be that champion team, and win a lot of business, you're going to need a process. The second question that we asked was, when you begin your pitch preparation, what's your priority? Anybody answer A? I guess they'd be scared to put up their hand after I just last <laughs> had the crack about PowerPoint, I would have thought. Okay. Um, anybody D? Anybody B? That's fair. That's fair. I mean, look, I would argue that really the goal of pitching is pretty straightforward. In most situations, um, the goal of pitching would be to win business. Uh, I, had a, I had, did have one situation in commercial real estate where I do a lot of work. There was a pitch with a team and the, they, sometimes a lot of people will pitch and present be, uh, because if they're not part of the process or they're not seen to be interested in the client's um, process, then they won't get a chance. So there's, there's an element of, oh, it's, it's our turn, but you've got to pitch and, and participate. So in that particular situation, they were viewed, I think there were about eight competing pitches, and my client was viewed as pretty much rock bottom. 
Um, but they, my client just sort of said, oh, look, we've got to do because we're getting pressure. They're saying we've got to participate in this. I said, okay, that's no worries, that's okay. So let's just make sure we're very specific about what our goal is. And we made our goal is to change the perception of our ability in the decision maker's mind. Right, so we're coming in probably number eight. As a result of that pitch, they were perceived as, and the theme of the pitch, we said, uh, such and such team a better fit than you may think. Okay, so that's how we titled the pitch because that aimed the goal. And you know what? They changed the perception in the very next round, they won a deal um, with that client. So I agree that goal's not a bad answer. Obviously the answer I'm looking for is to, to understand the decision makers. Um, in, a pitch, uh, in a pitch war room, if you do a lot of pitching, uh, we recommend that you actually establish a war room that gets locked uh, through lock and key at night. You should have like flip charts and sheets up there with almost character assassination of, of all the people and all the decision makers you're going through in terms of their rational needs, emotional needs, you know, what's really, really important. Uh, you know, I'll give you a word of advice. Well, let me ask you this question. When you receive an RFP, for example, to what degree do you think that covers the needs of the decision makers? 10%, 90%, 50%? Throw a figure at me. What do you think? 10%. Five to ten, but isn't it interesting how sometimes we treat oh the holy RFP oh we've got to do exactly what the RFP says. So you know be aware if that's happening in your company, you're going in and you're coming up with a proposal or a pitch. You're working on a pitch that is only based on five or ten percent of the needs. Now I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'd say different RFPs there are different situations. Some RFPs I've seen probably up to fifty percent, but make no mistake, you could answer an RFP one hundred percent correctly in your mind, it's not going to guarantee the business. Okay, it's about the decision makers. Okay, that's going to lead me to question three, which I'm going to have a bit of fun with. Um, JP Morgan says people buy things for two reasons, the right reason and the real reason. What do you think he meant? <coughs> you're, just, you're just putting your hand up to sort of, you know, because you're starting to get a bit bored. Uh, excellent. Anybody want to have a crack at that? Over the back here. <coughs> Absolutely. The right reason is the rational reason and the real reason is emotional. Now I want you to think about that. Right? Just, just think about the sheer logic of this. Individuals make decisions, not companies. All right? And we're acknowledging here people buy things for two reasons. The right reason and the real reason. I want you to all think of a significant purchase that you've made in recent times. How much was it uh, rational and how much was it emotional? So rational things are things that you can typically measure. Okay, time, uh, volume, price, they're things that you can typically measure. They're things, the values that are imposed. Uh, emotional or somewhat irrational decision making criteria, status, ego, like, dislike. You don't think in a pitching situation, someone's across the table and you're looking at them and you're going, oh, do I want to work with that person? Do I actually like that person? I don't really like the suit, you know. They say something, they've got a funny voice or something like that. They're all things that are going to impact your decision making. It, um, am I not correct? It's, that's real life. So that's what we've got to do. You've got to stop and think about that. So pricing is a real fascination of mine in terms of how people get so enamoured with pricing in the pitch process. Technically speaking, to be a little bit academic about it, price happens in the negotiation. So to really understand the RFP process and what's going on here, it's largely led through procurement. And what procurement are doing is they're playing a negotiation tactic with you because what they're doing is they, they'll say, it's got to be, the proposal's got to be answered in this way, so you can put it in my spreadsheet so I can then negotiate. So you've got the synthetic bid, for example. So let's just say you've got a synthetic bid uh, and a person, and they're trying to procure, this company's trying to procure a car. All right, so they go to all the car manufacturers and they say, um, Name me the price of your tyres, price of the chassis, price of the interior, all of that. And people do it. People, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, knowing that they're going to negotiate and say, oh, I think you, you know, Mr. Toyota, I think you're a bit too heavy on the tyres, you're going to have to bring that down, blah, 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 the chassis is a bit, you know, a bit expensive, blah, blah, blah. It's all negotiation. So they're bringing negotiation into the pitching process. Uh, and sometimes we just don't have the courage to go back and say, well, hang on, uh, you didn't ask me the proposal that you want a car. You don't want car parts. Okay, and also could we talk about the car that we've proposed? You know, if we're talking about price now, does that mean you've agreed to the car? You've agreed to the solution? Okay, so be very careful to get sucked in around price. I, I recommend 
very heavily in when you're responding, when you're pitching, the way to treat price is to say, indicatively speaking, this is what the price could be. The price absolutely could be this. And you make it the cheapest possible price you can. Right? So you're just competitive. It could be that. You know, what I'd love to do is when we get to the situation, because this is a significant uh, purchase and a significant bid, we'd like to sit around the negotiation table and negotiate something that's mutually rewarding to both parties. And that's just, that's just common sense. Yet people get sucked in to playing the games that the procurement pay. Is that a fair point? All right, we don't confront uh, enough. So my point about the price. Uh, now this will be interesting. Um, who, anybody answer A? Anybody gutsy enough to answer A? Good for you. Absolutely good for you. Um, I, 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 I'm going to promote that it's B. I'm going to say there probably is a little bit of an element and I think if your price is just way out of the ballpark then they're going to probably cross you on the, off the list. But I think in most competitive situations your price is going to be there or about. Now, has anybody had the feedback? You've submitted a proposal and you get the feedback, ah uh, no, you lost on price. You had that? Okay, excuse the language, I call that bullshit. All right? Absolutely call that BS. Um, and let's just have a random sample here, right? Individuals make decisions, uh, not companies, remember. Hypothetically speaking, let's say we all lost our mobile phone. Okay, we all lost our mobile phone. We immediately had to go out there and uh, go downtown or whatever and buy a new phone immediately. Who here, hand prominently up, would deliberately buy the cheapest phone on the market? One, two, Okay, so we've got a random survey, so it's two people out of, what have we got, about a 70 or 80 people, do you reckon? So two people out of 70 or 80 people are saying they would deliberately go and buy the cheapest product. Have I, you know, have I proved my point? So what I would suspect in many instances when people say you've lost out on price, that's how they're justifying it. I wouldn't say that is the real reason. Question? Here's what I'm going to say. Look, look, statutory authorities and, and government uh, funded areas are, are tricky. That, that, that's tough. Um, <coughs> gee, with their point system though, they make some completely irrational decisions. Um, no doubt about that. But if you just sort of go with me conceptually here, if you had the best solution, if you really had the best solution that was the best for that university or for the, the proponent that you're proposing uh, for the client, don't you think don't you think that they would come to you and say, love your solution, we're going to have to do something about price? You don't think so? Oh, yeah, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, never say never. Uh, is, is that a fair comment? Never say never. How often do you confront that, this very issue? Sometimes. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm prepared to buy it in shades and degrees. On the whole though, I find when I really challenge clients, they don't actually confront and they don't test the water as well. Um, if I lost out on price, I would be going immediately back and saying, why would you rule me out on price when I said in my proposal this was an indicative price? And you know, we certainly don't want to lose the business on price. You know, why, why would you do that? Why wouldn't we negotiate over it? And I think you'll find if you dig enough, you'll find it's not really about price. All right. now, as I say, I'm sure there are shades and degrees and I'm sure there are situations where it is 100% on price. I don't, what I'm going to say is it's not uh, that significant in the pitching. So just be very aware, it's part of negotiation and be careful not to get sucked in. All right. A negotiation tactic, the best, do, best way to deal with a negotiation tactic is if you can recognise when a negotiation tactic is being played on you, you can render it useless. And that's what procurement are doing right, in the RFP process, so be very, very aware of that. Okay, so again, the key points that I wanted to highlight around individuals, the key point, it stops and starts with the individual. Think about it, decision maker, it's an individual. So you've got to try and get inside their head. That's 
the whole secret. If so, you know, I'd say sales is, is pretty easy at the end of the day. Really all you've got to do is you've got to work out, or sorry, sales is pretty simple. Okay? All you have to work out is what's going to block or promote someone's willingness to buy. But you've got to be clever at that. It's not easy because you've got to try and get inside their head and what makes them click. And then it makes it even more uh, confusing when there's a committee or when there's a group involved. And that's when you have to go through the audience. And uh, what we recommend is work out what you think the relationship, on a scale of one to 10, how good is the relationship? If one was no relationship, 10, uh, that good a relationship, you'd marry them kind of thing. You know, where are you on that? And how well also do you feel that you actually understand their needs? Have you communicated? Um, I would dare say if you haven't met the decision makers and you're in an RFP situation and you just submit a proposal blindly, hate to be the bearer of bad news, I wouldn't, put, so I wouldn't give yourself a red hot go at winning that. Is that a fair thing? I mean, would you make, if you think about, and I'm talking in the context of business to business here, so we're starting to talk about significant cash, significant money here. You know, would you really put your company's money at risk uh, and give it to a client where you've never met them before? just kind of doesn't make sense, okay? So that leads to the conversation I had over the, the guy over here in the sales process. That's why the discovery process is so important. Uh, and so many people get their sales process mixed up, they start pitching too early because they haven't got a good understanding of their client's needs. And here's what I'd say too, is if you get uh, an invitation to, to pitch or to put a proposal, but you haven't met the decision makers, what I've recommended to many clients is say, go back and say, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to provide a proposal. Love that. You know, at uh, ABC, where we work, what we like to do is we like to really customise and put a special solution in that's really going to help our, our clients' needs. So to do that, we need to diagnose further past the RFP because you know, we've worked out that RFPs really don't get a, a good, they're not a good indication necessarily or an optimal indication of the, the decision makers and the stakeholders' uh, needs. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a 20-minute meeting where we can just ask some questions, even a five-minute phone call. Yet because everybody, and, and I want you to think about that logic too, because a lot of people say, oh, no, you can't do that because oh, in the RFP it says, you know, do not contact, you know, you can't contact at all. We're gonna, just think about the stupidity, stupidity associated with that. All right, so they're saying they can't contact you. They're saying they want a customised solution, but oh, no, oh, no, you can't talk to me. You can't talk to me. Imagine if you're trying to go to the doctor. You're going to the doctor and you say, oh, something's wrong with me, but you're going to have to give me some drugs. All right, well, can I ask you a few questions? No, sorry, no. It's about as silly as that, okay? So I strongly recommend that you do. And if the client uh, that you want to pitch to or has issued the RFP refuses you, then you've got the right to go back and say, well, look, I have to let this opportunity pass. How can I give you a solution to a problem if I can't really diagnose probably analyse what that's, you know, what the, what the situation is. Okay, so have the courage to confront every now and then, all in the interests of wanting to provide a good solution to the client. Okay, so that leads me now to the second area of questions that we're going to do. We're going to talk about solutions and how solutions is so important as it relates to pitching too. I've probably given away some of the answers already, but we'll see how we go. So, this is, this is one of my favourite questions. The first one for solutions. Fundamentally, and I'll say that again, fundamentally, an RFP requests A, B, C, or D. Okay, out of the following phrases, which is most relevant for pitching? I would expect a probably 100% success rate on that question, given what I've just been talking about. And the last question is, according to Gartner Research, everybody familiar with Gartner? Uh, they recently bought a company called the Corporate Executive Board, which uh, produces some excellent uh, material on sales effectiveness and coaching and things like that. So they're now part of Gartner. How significant, how significant is demonstrated experience in why businesses buy from other businesses? So, probably the best words of advice anybody gave to me uh, when it came to sales, and I've been in pretty hardcore sales now for the oh, best part of 25 years, I guess. Uh, best thing I've ever heard, best words of advice were, 
Uh, as soon as you forget about making the sale is when you'll make the sale. Okay, so just think about that. As soon as you forget about making the sale is when you'll make the sale. Easy to say, and I know you really, you'll nod and say, oh yeah, it makes sense to me. I want you to really stop and think about it. As soon as you forget about making the sale is when you'll make the sale. So my key point for you and why solutions is so important is if you, if you really want to help a client, then diagnose their situation and prove how you can make it better. Prove how you can make it better than anybody else. So people caught, talk about differentiation. And for a bit of fun, I pulled out uh, a proposal from a client and I looked up their section on differentiation or the differentiators. And you're all uh, doing it, you're all familiar with the, in the proposal process uh, procurement or the people, the authors of the RFP will say, you know, can please describe what your differentiators are? Can I just give you some words of advice? You can't. Seriously, you cannot answer that question. Unless you go back to them and say, okay, happy to describe what's different, Could you, would you mind sending all the other proposals to me? And then I'd be able to work out what's different. Seriously, let me give you an example. And I tell you what, did I not just cut this out of a proposal this morning? Absolutely, it, uh, I love this. So this is in a section of a proposal and it's under the heading differentiators. Okay? This is what this company, and this I'm going to say it goes into multi-millions of dollars. Right? This is how high stakes it is. Uh, it involves sale of an asset of around probably 300 to 400 million dollars. I kid you not, that, that's higher stakes in terms of pitching. And here's some of the differentiators. They're absolute rippers, wait for this. Ability, ability to answer questions with credibility. That's one of their differentiators. Ability to answer questions with credibility. And of course there's no other company that could ever, you know, purport to do that, could they? It gets better. Um, here's another differentiator. 100% commitment to the assignment. Oh, wow. Because most people are sort of well, subpar in terms of commitment to the assignment, absolutely. You know a company could commit to that whatsoever. Uh, high localised sales expertise. Okay. So no other company's got local salespeople. So when you stop and think about it, this is just insanity. Okay, so you know, words of advice when it comes to when you're answering those sections on differentiation. I mean, I define differentiation, true differentiation in this day and age is understanding your clients better than your competitors. That's true differentiation. Could just think about it. Anybody aware that in the world in the year 2014, the world produced more information than the period of 3000 BC to 2008? Okay, so in one year, we produce more information than a period of 5,000 years. So no matter what your products and services are, okay, no matter what they are, uh, I can Google what you are, how do I do, so what's your line of service? Software. Software, okay, so I can Google, you're coming to pitch to me, and I Google, you know, uh, how do I deal with a software salesperson specialising in whatever it is that you specialise in. And all of a sudden, my education has completely gone up here. So, you know, don't tell me that, you know, your products are different to the others. Because in the eyes of the decision maker, they're not really. So turn that paradigm the other way and create differentiation by understanding the clients better than your individuals. Okay? That's what I would strongly recommend. Uh, let's get to some answers here to the questions. So the first question, fundamentally an RFP requests. Fundamentally, what does RFP stand for? Request for proposal. So, um, the answer, the C is the definition of what a proposal is. So that's fundamentally what an RFP is going for. It's fascinating how the RFP process is morphed into the situation that it has. In many instances, the RFP doesn't actually ask you for a solution, does it? So you could almost go back to them and say, I've had to include a solution or a proposal part because I would be non-compliant to your RFP, which is request for proposal. You've requested a proposal, you haven't given me the latitude in your questions to actually ask for that. I would have the courage to do that. Because I tell you what, there's differentiation for you. It's not request for answers to questions. And you'll find typically in most RFPs as well, They'll say, at a minimum, in your proposal, make sure you include answers to these questions or address these requirements. But people don't take that a step far. All right? 
It's just a checklist. It's a procurement thing, all right? So why wouldn't you? And we'll talk about um, communicating in the power of three in a minute. Um, but what we recommend when it comes to proposals is we'll say there's a your needs section, there's an our solution section, and there's an RFP compliance section. So the RFP compliance section, that's exactly the same of everybody else's proposal because that's what everybody does. That's what they'll be talking about next door or wherever the other thing is because that's how you make your RFP or your proposals efficient. Right? Remember I'm talking about quality. You think about it, you're, you're reading all the proposals coming in and they're all answers to questions, answers to questions, and oh, here's something, your needs. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, and they've actually got a solution to actually solve my needs. Fantastic. Oh, by the way, they're compliant. Excellent. There's differentiation for you. Okay. So you've got to, you know, stop thinking about making the sale. Start thinking about how you make your client's situation better. You know, have the courage to be totally maniacally focused on helping the client. Uh, and it's a bit like field of dreams. Build it, they will come. All right. And that's what I mean by as soon as you forget about making the sale is when you make the sale. So that's the first question. The second question is out of the following phrases. Okay, so prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Okay, I would have expected everybody to get that. And stop and think about it. And you know, when I first heard the phrase, I thought, oh, it's a little bit cheesy. But the more I thought about it, it is so accurate. It really is. And if that's not your governing philosophy on how you win business, then good luck to you. Because it's just too competitive in this day and age not to really try and help meet your client's needs. That's where it starts and stops. It starts and stops with the individuals. So get to know those indi individuals and prove to them in your proposal that you can make their situation better, better than anybody else. Okay, but it's got to come with diagnosis. The last thing we talked about uh, was the Gartner research. Um, in terms of uh, demonstrated expertise. So that, those, that differentiation, where I got that proposal, uh, about the first 10 pages of the proposal was all about them. Okay, it was all about them and all about their track record. So in this day and age, what Gartner argues is people don't care anymore. It's barely significant. So the answer to the question is barely significant. Look, if you need some reassurance that you're the best, go and put, give your proposal to your mum. She'll tell you the best, absolutely. <laughs> she won't let you down. All right, so if you need a bit of a pat on the back and you need a bit of enthusiasm, go and do that. Okay, but you've got to solve the client's situation. You've got to make their situation better. You've got to solve for their problems. That's what the client wants. Going into it a bit more detail, uh, Gartner says what they want, they want to hear something they haven't heard before. They want to be tested. They want to be challenged. Okay, so challenge them. Uh, anybody familiar with the Challenger Sale, the book, The Challenger Sale? Okay, so a couple of hands here. Um, I wouldn't suggest you need to go out and buy it. Those guys have made a fair bit of money. They don't need any more. Uh, but the concept of the challenger sale is just pretty much a consulting one, and that is in your RFP, for example, if it says uh, we need A, B, and C, that's fine, challenge them. Because you, if you're in a situation, you've got companies who aren't experts in your product, right, and they're posing the questions to you. Probably should be the other way around in reality. So what the challenger sale says is go back to the client and say, in addition to A, B, and C, because A, B, and C will get you a solution, but it won't get you the optimal solution. So I'd like to challenge you and say, you also need D, E, and F. So you know what? How about you judge everybody else in terms of this competitive process on A, B, and C, but for me, um, can you measure me on A, B, C, D, E, and F? Because that's an optimal solution. Okay? That's the mentality that you've got to be thinking of. Again, so that's a way to create differentiation rather than, it, Great IT term, and a lot of companies are saying this at the moment, oh, we've got a great platform. Our platform's better than your platform, and I'm working with companies at the moment. My platform's bigger than your platform, and it's just insane because the decision makers, through their eyes, it's all the same. Okay, so that's the solutions part. All right, uh, we'll wrap up in a minute. Let's finish with the third and last round around communication. And uh, before I make the key point, let's go through the questions. Uh, question number one for communication. What is MPP, so it's our company's again, what is our view on explicitly stating why you should win at the beginning of a proposal? There are some fun answers there. What is our view of, on explicitly stating why you should win at the beginning of a proposal? Question number two. What is the optimal number of areas, sections that we recommend in having a pitch or a presentation.
And I'm fascinated to know what you think a PowerPoint deck is. And I've given you some options there for question three. OK. Uh, so question number one. Actually, before I go to question number one. So the key thing that I want you to walk away with about communication. Uh, I'm going to say this in a couple of different ways. First of all, you know what you're saying. Your audience, or the listener, they don't know what they're hearing. Okay? That's a really, really important thing. Another way to say this is this is a bit of a quote from anybody who watched Mad Men on TV? Yeah. So you all know Mad Men. Um, they make constant reference to this guy called Bill Burnback, uh, who was a guru in advertising in the States back in that era. He's got this fantastic quote that says, good presenters care what he or she says. Superb communicators only care what their audience hears. Okay? So good presenters care what he or she says. Superb communicators only care what their audience hears. And a big part of that is actually just clarity and making things simple to follow. So many presentations I've seen are so complex. You can't even work out where you're going or what's being offered. So if the person can't follow where you're going, they're not going to buy your product or your service. Okay? So, so much of persuasion is just around clarity and, and simplicity. Um, the first question is, uh, did anybody say A? No? Bit passive, that one. Um, B? Anybody go for B? Anybody have D? So, really? Everybody got to C? Very good. Um, I put D in there, that's really interesting. And this is what a lot of people actually think. They say, oh, well, you can't say that again because we've already said that word, so let's, why don't we say it in a different way? Here's one thing that you need to get over, and you'll find me very repetitive through the course of today because I'm going to come back and summarise some key points and things like that. Repetition is a really good thing. Okay? Repetition builds reinforcement and reinforcement builds retention. And you want the individual listener to retain the information that you're communicating to them. So there's a fantastic quote, and I think I've got it on the back. If you turn the back, just have a look at that quote from Winston Churchill. And ain't that the truth, seriously, as you think about, you know what you're saying, I don't know what I'm hearing. OK, now, I kind of gave this one away as well. What's the optimal number? of areas that are covered in a pitch or a presentation? Uh, yes, it's three. I want you all, I'm going to challenge you all, when you go back to your desk, when you go back to work, have a look at the last PowerPoint deck that you put together. A, I tell you what, A, if you've got an agenda, that's a good thing. But B, what I want you to do is count how many agenda items that you've got on there. If you've got greater than three, be aware you're not communicating in the most effective way. And I've brought the, our academic expert uh, from our team, Lillian, who studied uh, semiotics at uh, UFT. So first of all, Lillian, what is semiotics? Uh, semiotics is the science of communication. So it's looking at why and how we understand things the way that we do. So the power of three was something that we studied quite a lot. And, and it was excellent to come to MPP and find out that it's something that we promote. Because the power of three just promotes effective communications for optimal listening. So there are three areas that we can look at to explain this. Society, business, and science. From a societal perspective, if you think about it, society's kind of built on threes. One, two, three, A, B, C, do, re, mi, high, medium, low, gold, silver, bronze, tall, grande, venti. It's just everywhere. It's the way that we communicate. When we look at business, power of three is also used a lot. TSA, three simple steps to security. Uh, Apple, relatively successful company, I think we can all agree. All their product launches are based on threes. The last iPad was thinner, lighter, faster or the AirPods, which have completely taken over. Uh, wireless, effortless, magical. So the reason for this, we just have to look to science. What neurologists and cognitive scientists have discovered is that our cognitive capacity, which is the number of items that can be held in mind simultaneously, is limited to three. So that's why three is really the only number you need to know when it comes to communications. Now, does anybody want to challenge this woman? <laughs> All right, Lillian, thank you very much. Okay, um, and if you want to know if, if you've been given a stipulated agenda, uh, which often happens, procurement says you've got to cover all of these pieces, uh, give us a call and we'll quickly tell you how you manipulate that and turn that around to show you can cover, can cover it all in three areas. Uh, so let me finish off on the PowerPoint deck. Um, 
Here's one thing I ask you as a favour. Okay? When someone says, can you email me the presentation, uh, unless you videotape the presentation, can you please go back to them and say, no, I can't because I didn't video the presentation. Okay? They're slides. Okay? They're a visual aid. That's what they are. They're a visual aid. PowerPoint is one of the most uh, misunderstood tools. It's a tool as a visual aid. Visual aid. Okay? Maybe I've got my point in. Um, yet people think that's the actual pitch or that's the presentation. I have people that actually put a PowerPoint deck together and say, they say, here's my pitch. You know, I have a bit of difficulty with those people because that's not really reflective of the effort that goes into winning a piece of business. And there's lots of different ways in which to uh, use visual aids. You had a question. What, what's your view of using PowerPoint for web access versus in person? Because with the web app, Um, I, I think I think look, PowerPoint's a good vehicle for the, for the webinar kind of thing because it's one way to, to capture their attention. Um, you're going to get me on a whole different topic when it comes to video conferencing and things like that. Come up after if you want, and we can chat about it uh, for sure. Um, but first of all, here's what I want you to think. I want you to imagine this. Uh, I want you to be in this situation. Let's say you put your deck together. Uh, you're going to pitch your products and service, you go to the decision maker, the decision maker grabs the deck from you and says, oh, fantastic, you put a book together for me. Brilliant. Takes the book, goes into his elaborate office, opens up the cupboard, uh, and it's full of pitch books. Throws it in there, closes the door, sits back down, and then says, great, what do you got for me? You know, my question to you is, how prepared would you be for that situation? If you want to be really good at pitching, and if you want to win a lot of business, you need to be prepared for that situation because, be warned, there are people that will do that. Okay? And, and when you think about it, you should be able to do that. You should be able to go, exactly this gentleman back here, we, we talked about story. Go and tell your story. Tell a story they can't refuse about why your solution is better than your competitor's solution. That's what you should do. The visual aids. I mean, how much have I relied on this? Yeah, I've read the questions out of it. But really, um, I can't email us and say, oh, great presentation from Hamish. Here it is. Wouldn't get much out of it, I would have thought. Okay, uh, so a couple of things uh, about um, visual aids as well. I want you to picture, uh, I'm going to explain, here's another way you can communicate visual aids. I want you to imagine you've got a cup and a saucer. Okay, so everybody visualise a cup and a saucer. The cup, I'm going to equate the cup to the story. I'm going to equate the saucer to the visual aids or the supporting material. Okay? Now, picture paints a thousand words. I want you to think about that. That's putting visual aids into context. It's all about the story. Okay? Picture paints a thousand words. Um, all right. Uh, and I thought I'd leave one more thing about the... Um, I thought this is just a fascinating thing, too. I've been working with a lot of uh, uh, agricultural folks, and here's a true story when it comes to communication. Uh, and it sort of relates back to that first question I asked about explicitly stating why you should be successful. I want you to remember this. If you don't tell me why I should be listening, I will make my own assumptions. So yes, so I wrote a book, and it's called What You're Not Doing That Makes All The Difference, because I want people to pick up the book, and I want, them, I want to have influence over how they look at it, because they're going to look at it now and go, all right, well, what am I not doing? Right? So all, and automatically, I've got them thinking about that. Here's something fascinating. In Sweden, uh, they do this now. I want you to imagine you've got two chicken farms. They're both exactly the same in terms of how they treat their chickens. One of them has a sign in front of their chicken farm that says, happy and healthy chickens live here. Which farm are you going to go to? There you go. That's the power of communication. And I've got a lot more stories about that in terms of how you can use communication very powerfully. So I'm going to wrap up there. We might have time for a couple of questions, I, I think. Uh, the key points I wanted to highlight again for you in terms of the individuals. Just remember, individuals make decisions, not companies. It starts and stops with the decision maker. If you don't know them, get to know them because that's your avenue to win business. Um, we talked about solutions. And that's really what you've got to think about when you're pitching, if you want to win business. Uh, if you want to help a client, diagnose their situation and then propose uh, a solution or propose a proposition that's going to make their situation better, better than your competitors. That's, you've got to have that. You've got to have a solution uh, in your pitching process. And communication, you know, remember this notion too. You know, good presenters care what he or she says. Superb communicators only care what their audience hears. 
So all of that, I trust that there's a couple of nuggets in there for you to walk away with in terms of to start doing something different. Uh, and remember, it's what you're not doing that makes all the difference. So there's a lot of things there for you to, to think about. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if we've got uh, time for Q&A. A couple of questions? Okay. A couple of questions. The sales process is references and what other clients would say about your company. And I think because there's individuals making the decisions that that's a really important piece of it. So I wonder if you can say anything about how you prep a client to be a reference, um, what, like how that plays into the process of the pitch and how, like when you bring that in and what some of the, the pitfalls that you can get into there are. Whew. Which question did you want me to answer? Oh. <laughs> okay, so let's put things into context a little bit to start off with. What you're talking about references, or even you want to talk about track record, things like that, technically speaking, that's a form of evidence. Okay, so I'll define evidence as anything that supports your case. Now, this is really important when it relates to story too, and, I, and, I'll, and think about evidence as you would in the courtroom. What you can't, what, what's not gonna work in the courtroom, I walk in and I say, judge, jury, uh, DNA on the hair, Case solved. Everybody's going to look at you as you've got seven heads. Huh? What? You need a story. You need context around it. So, it, so it's just there as evidence to support your case to start off with. So, you know, if don't have sections in your proposal named case studies. Have sections in your proposal about how you're going to solve for the client and then have evidence to prove that you can do it before. So that's putting evidence in the right context. Now, let me define proof. Proof is the right amount of the right kind of evidence to convince the decision maker. Remember, it stops and starts with the decision maker. Some people will rely heavily on references. Some people won't. So if you diagnose uh, correctly what's important to the decision maker, that you'll be able to work out what the right sort of evidence is. I probably haven't answered your question 100%, um, but that's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, and you know, just keep asking the clients, you know, if you've asked for references, what's what do you need that for, or, or something like that, uh, I guess. But the best you can word up your clients who are giving the references uh, comes down to a relationship. Uh, one more question, yeah. Uh, what tricks do you use to get pitch teams comfortable using less slides or no slides at all? Because I have a company that like leans on slides. And they're like, oh, we're missing that slide, we're missing that slide. Um, and you try to push back, and you know they go into the room, and they present, and they're like, we wish we had that slide. And so I would suggest you're in a very unique situation. Nobody else would be in that situation, would you? <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard of that. Um, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. I worked for a company and they told me this story. They had to go and meet a client in um, Amsterdam, major Dutch company. They spent two weeks, they sent about 20 people over. They spent two weeks putting together a 200 page deck. Uh, they got to the meeting, two, and about 20 people flying over business class, no doubt. Uh, all that work. Client looks at it in the first 30 seconds. Yeah, no, that's not what we wanted to meet about. Um, she, where, where do you start? Probably the best way to do it is to actually do a rehearsal. Do a rehearsal, have a go, and, to, and give them feedback. And when you're giving feedback, always use the term aware. So you can say, sort of, are you aware when you were talking about the such and such section that Bob or Sue or whatever was presenting and put a slide up. I didn't know whether to read the slide, I didn't know whether to listen to it. Consequently, um, I didn't really read because the slides on its own didn't make much sense. I, I couldn't listen to it, I was so distracted, so I found that section of the presentation a complete waste of time. Because that's the reality. So the better you can get objective people to come in, um, the better. I mean, it's just, it's just reality. And I think, I think on the whole, companies are getting better uh, around this. Here's the, here's the problem is people don't understand what PowerPoint is. They don't understand it's a visual aid. And so what people do is they now send proposals in PowerPoint. All right? And it's, it's too brief to read, so it doesn't make sense, but it's too detailed for a visual aid. They're trying to cover both things, and they're missing out, and they're striking out in both things. You know, so use PowerPoint as a visual aid. Here's an idea for a proposal uh, or a leave behind. You want to probably read it. Uh, from beginning to end. Um, so what I put in word. 
You know, it's just common sense. All right, uh, I th I'm looking at a, a, uh, a sign here and it says time's up. So I think that's time for me to finish. Thank you very much. You've been a fun audience. I uh, wish you all the best.